This recording is a product of Audio Anarchy, an attempt to bring accessibility to learning around the world. The Conquest of Bread by Pyotr Kropotkin. In Chapter 1, Kropotkin makes his case that human beings are, as a species, incredibly wealthy, able to provide comfortably for all. He then goes on to describe the world's material circumstances despite that ability the concentration of that wealth in the hands of a very few, and the effects of that concentration. The chapter ends with an impassioned call for an uncomplicated ethics. We must use our resources to provide well-being for all. And so we begin chapter two of The Conquest of Bread, Well-Being for All. Well-being for all is not a dream. It is possible realizable, owing to all that our ancestors have done to increase our powers of production. We know, indeed, that the producers, although they constitute hardly one-third of the inhabitants of civilized countries, even now produce such quantities of goods that a certain degree of comfort could be brought to every hearth. We know further that of all those who squander today the fruits of others' toil were forced to employ their leisure in useful work, our wealth would increase in proportion to the number of producers and more. Finally, we know that contrary to the theory enunciated by Malthus, that oracle of middle-class economics, the productive powers of the human race increase at a much more rapid ratio than its powers of reproduction. The more thickly men are crowded on the soil, the more rapid is the growth of their wealth-creating power. Thus, although the population of England has only increased from 1844 to 1890 by 62%, its production has grown, to say the least, at double that rate, to wit, by 130%. In France, where the population has grown more slowly, the increase in production is nevertheless very rapid, notwithstanding the crises through which agriculture is frequently passing, notwithstanding state interference, the blood tax conscription, and speculative commerce and finance, the production of wheat in France has increased fourfold, and industrial production more than tenfold. In the course of the last 80 years, in the United States, the process is still more striking in spite of immigration, or rather precisely because of the influx of surplus European labor, the United States have multiplied their wealth tenfold. However, these figures give yet a very faint idea of what our wealth might become under better conditions. For alongside of the rapid development of our wealth-producing powers, we have an overwhelming increase in the ranks of idlers and middlemen. Instead of capital gradually concentrating itself in a few hands so that it would only be necessary for the community to dispossess a few millionaires and enter upon its lawful heritage, instead of this socialist forecast proving true, the exact reverse is coming to pass the swarm of parasites is ever increasing. In France, there are not 10 actual producers to every 30 inhabitants. The whole agricultural wealth of the country is the work of less than seven millions of men. And in the two great industries, mining and the textile trade, you will find that the workers number less than two and one half millions. But the exploiters of labor, how many are they? In England, exclusive of Scotland and Ireland, only one million workers, men, women, and children, are employed in all the textile trades. Rather more than half a million work the mines, rather less than half a million till the ground. And the statisticians have to exaggerate all the figures in order to establish a maximum of 8 million producers to 26 million inhabitants. Strictly speaking, the creators of the goods exported from Britain to all the ends of the earth comprise only from 6 to 7 million workers. And what is the sum of the shareholders and middlemen who levy the first fruits of labor from far and near and heap up unearned gains by thrusting themselves between the producer and the consumer, paying the former not a fifth, not a twentieth of the price they exact from the latter. Nor is this all. Those who withhold capital constantly reduce the output by restraining production. 
We need not speak of the cartloads of oysters thrown into the sea to prevent a dainty, hitherto reserved for the rich, from becoming a food for the people. We need not speak of the thousand and one luxuries, stuffs, foods, etc., etc., treated after the same fashion as the oysters. It is enough to remember the way in which the production of the most necessary things is limited. Legions of miners are ready and willing to dig out coal every day and send it to those who are shivering with cold, but too often a third or even two-thirds of their number are forbidden to work more than three days a week because, forsooth, the price of coal must be kept up. Thousands of weavers are forbidden to work the looms, though their wives and children go in rags, and though three-quarters of the population of Europe have no clothing worthy the name. Hundreds of blast furnaces, thousands of factories, periodically stand idle. Others only work half-time. And in every civilized nation, there is a permanent population of about two million individuals who ask only for work, but to whom work is denied. How gladly would these millions of men set to work to reclaim wastelands or to transform ill-cultivated land into fertile fields rich in harvests, a year of well-directed toil would suffice to multiply fivefold the produce of dry lands in the south of France, which now yield only about eight bushels of wheat per acre. But these men, who would be happy to become hardy pioneers in so many branches of wealth-producing activity must stay their hands because the owners of the soil, the mines, and the factories prefer to invest their capital, stolen in the first place from the community, in Turkish or Egyptian bonds or in Patagonian gold mines, and so make Egyptian, Italian, and Chinese people their wage slaves. So much for the direct and deliberate limitation of production, but there is also a limitation indirect and not of set purpose, which consists in spending human toil on objects absolutely useless or destined only to satisfy the dull vanity of the rich. It is impossible to reckon in figures the extent to which wealth is restricted indirectly the extent to which energy is squandered that might have served to produce and above all to prepare the machinery necessary to production it is enough to cite the immense sums spent by europe in armaments for the sole purpose of acquiring control of the markets and so forcing her own commercial standards on neighboring territories and making exploitation easier at home the millions paid every year to officials of all sorts whose function it is to maintain the rights of minorities, the right, that is, of a few rich men to manipulate the economic activities of the nation, the millions spent on judges, prisons, policemen, and all the paraphernalia of so-called justice, spent to no purpose because we know that every alleviation, however slight, of the wretchedness of our great cities is followed by a very considerable diminution of crime. Lastly, the millions spent on propagating pernicious doctrines by means of the press and news cooked in the interest of this or that party, of this politician, or of that company of exploiters. But over and above this, we must take into account all the labor that goes to sheer waste in keeping up the stables, the kennels, and the retinue of the rich. For instance, in pandering to the caprices of society and to the depraved tastes of the fashionable mob, in forcing the consumer, on the one hand, to buy what he does not need, or foisting an inferior article upon him by means of puffery, and in producing, on the other hand, wares which are absolutely injurious, but profitable to the manufacturer. What is squandered in this manner would be enough to double our real wealth, or so to plenish our mills and factories with machinery that they would soon flood the shops with all that is now lacking to two-thirds of the nation. Under our present system, 
a full quarter of the producers in every nation are forced to be idle for three or four months in the year, and the labor of another quarter, if not of the half, has no better results than the amusement of the rich or the exploitation of the public. Thus, if we consider on the one hand the rapidity with which civilized nations augment their powers of production, and on the other hand, the limits set to that production, be it directly or indirectly, by existing conditions, one cannot but conclude that an economic system a trifle more enlightened would permit them to heap up in a few years so many useful products that they would be constrained to cry, Enough! We have enough coal and bread and raiment. Let us rest and consider how best to use our powers, how best to employ our leisure. No. Plenty for all is not a dream. Though it was a dream indeed in those old days when man, for all his pains, could hardly win a bushel of wheat from an acre of land, and had to fashion by hand all the implements he used in agriculture and industry, now it is no longer a dream, because man has invented a motor, which, with a little iron and a few pounds of coal, gives him the mastery of a creature strong and docile as a horse, and capable of setting the most complicated machinery in motion. But if plenty for all is to become a reality, this immense capital, cities, houses, pastures, arable lands, factories, highways, education, must cease to be regarded as private property for the monopolist to dispose of at his pleasure. This rich endowment, painfully won, built, fashioned, or invented by our ancestors, must become common property so that the collective interests of men may gain from it the greatest good for all. There must be expropriation, the well-being of all the end, expropriation the means. Expropriation. Such, then, is the problem which history has put before the men of the 20th century, the return to communism in all that ministers to the well-being of man. But this problem cannot be solved by means of legislation. No one imagines that. The poor, no less than the rich, understand that neither the existing governments nor any which might arise out of possible political changes would be capable of finding a solution. We feel the necessity of social revolution. Rich and poor alike recognize that this revolution is imminent, that it may break out in a very few years. A great change in thought has been accomplished during the last half of the 19th century, but suppressed as it was by the propertied classes and denied its natural development, this new spirit must break now its bonds by violence and realize itself in a revolution. Whence comes the revolution? And how will it announce its coming? None can answer these questions. The future is hidden. But those who watch and think do not misinterpret the signs. Workers and exploiters, revolutionists and conservatives, thinkers and men of action, all feel that the revolution is at our doors. Well, what are we to do when the thunderbolt has fallen? We've all been studying the dramatic side of revolution so much and the practical work of revolution so little that we are apt to see only the stage effects, so to speak, of these great movements. The fight of the first days, the barricades. But this fight, this skirmish, is soon ended. And it is only after the overthrow of the old constitution that the real work of revolution can be said to begin. Defeat and powerless, attacked on all sides. The old rulers are soon swept away by the breath of insurrection. In a few days, the middle-class monarchy of 1848 was no more, and while Louis Philippe was making good his escape in a cab, Paris had already forgotten her citizen king. The government of Tyr disappeared on the 18th of March, 1871, in a few hours, leaving Paris mistress of her destinies. Yet 1848 and 1871 were only insurrections. 
Before a popular revolution, the masters of the old order disappear with a surprising rapidity. Its upholders fly the country to plot in safety elsewhere and to devise measures for their return. The former government having disappeared, the army, hesitating before the tide of popular opinion, no longer obeys its commanders, who have also prudently decamped. The troops stand by without interfering or join the rebels. The police, standing at ease, are uncertain whether to belabor the crowd or to cry, long live the commune, while some retire to their quarters to await the pleasure of the new government. Wealthy citizens pack their trunks and betake themselves to places of safety. The people remain. This is how a revolution is ushered in. In several large towns, the commune is proclaimed. In the streets wander thousands of men, who in the evening crowd into improvised clubs, asking, what shall we do? And ardently discuss public affairs, in which all take an interest. Those who yesterday were most indifferent are perhaps the most zealous. Everywhere there is plenty of goodwill and a keen desire to make victory certain. It is a time of supreme devotion. The people are ready to go forward. All this is splendid, sublime, but still, it is not a revolution. Nay, it is only now that the work of the revolutionist begins. Doubtless, the thirst for vengeance will be satisfied. The waitress the Watrons and the Thomases will pay the penalty of their unpopularity, but that is only an incident of the struggle, and not a revolution. Socialists, politicians, radicals, neglected geniuses of journalism, stump orators, middle-class citizens, and workmen hurry to the town hall, to the government offices, and take possession of the vacant seats. Some rejoice their hearts with galoon, admire themselves in ministerial mirrors, and study to give orders with an air of importance appropriate to their new position. They must have a red sash, an embroidered cap, and magisterial gestures to impress their comrades of the office or the workshop. Others bury themselves in official papers, trying with the best of wills to make head or tail of them. They indict laws and issue high-flown worded decrees that nobody takes the trouble to carry out because the revolution has come. To give themselves an authority which is lacking, they seek the sanction of old forms of government. They take the names of provisional government, committee of public safety, mayor, governor of the town hall, commissioner of public weal, and what not. Elected or acclaimed, they assemble in boards or in communal councils. These bodies include men of 10 or 20 different schools, which, if not exactly private chapels, are at least so many sects, which represent as many ways of regarding the scope, the bearing, and the goal of revolution. Possibilists, collectivists, radicals, Jacobins, Blanquists are thrust together and waste time in wordy warfare. Honest men come into contact with ambitious ones, whose only dream is power, and who spurn the crowd once they sprung. Coming together with diametrically opposed views, they are forced to form arbitrary alliances in order to create majorities that can but last a day, wrangling, calling each other reactionaries, authoritarians, and rascals incapable of coming to an understanding on any serious measure, dragged into discussions about trifles, producing nothing better than bombastic proclamations, yet taking themselves seriously, unwitting that the real strength of the movement is in the streets. All this may please those who like the theater, but it is not revolution. Nothing yet has been accomplished. Meanwhile, the people suffer. The factories are idle. The workshops closed. Industry is at a standstill. The worker does not even earn the meager wage which was his before. Food goes up in price, with that heroic devotion which has always characterized them, and which, in great crises, reaches the sublime, the people wait patiently. We place these three months of want at the service of the Republic, they said, in 1848, while their representatives and the gentlemen of the new government, down to the meanest jack in office, received their salary regularly. 
The people suffer with childlike faith, with the good humor of the masses who believe in their leaders. They think that yonder, in the house, in the town hall, in the committee of public safety, their welfare is being considered. But yonder, they are discussing everything under the sun except the welfare of the people. In 1793, when famine ravaged France and crippled the revolution, whilst the people were reduced to the depths of misery, whilst the Champs-Élysées were lined with luxurious carriages where women displayed their jewels and splendor, Robespierre was urging the Jacobins to discuss his treaties of the English Constitution. While the worker was suffering in 1848 from the general stoppage of trade, The provisional government and the House were wrangling over military pensions and prison labor without troubling how the people were to live during this crisis. And could one cast a reproach at the Paris Commune, which was born beneath the Prussian cannon and lasted only 70 days, it would be for this same error, this failure to understand that the revolution could not triumph unless those who fought on its side were fed that on 15 pence a day a man cannot fight on the ramparts and at the same time support a family. The people suffer and say, how to find a way out of these difficulties? It seems to us that there is only one answer to this question. We must recognize and loudly proclaim that everyone Whatever his grade in the old society, whether strong or weak, capable or incapable, has, before everything, the right to live, and that society is bound to share amongst all, without exception, the means of existence at its disposal. We must acknowledge this and proclaim it aloud and act up to it. It must be so contrived that from the first day of the revolution the worker shall know that a new era is opening before him, that henceforward none need crouch under the bridges with palaces hard by, none need fast in the midst of food, none need perish with cold near shops full of furs, that all is for all, in practice as well as in theory, and that at last, for the first time in history, A revolution has been accomplished which considers the needs of the people before schooling them in their duties. This cannot be brought about by acts of parliament, but only by taking immediate and effective possession of all that is necessary to ensure the well-being of all. This is the only really scientific way of going to work, the only way to be understood and desired by the mass of people. We must take possession in the name of the people, of the granaries, the shops of clothing, and the dwelling houses. Nothing must be wasted. We must organize without delay to feed the hungry, to satisfy all wants, to meet all needs, to produce, not for the special benefit of this one or that one, but to ensure that society as a whole will live and grow. Enough of ambiguous words, like the right to work, with which the people were misled in 1848, and which are still used to mislead them. Let us have the courage to recognize that well-being for all, henceforward possible, must be realized. When the workers claimed the right to work in 1848, national and municipal workshops were organized, and workmen were sent to drudge there at the rate of one shilling eight pence a day. When they asked that labor should be organized, the reply was, patience, friends, the government will see to it. Meantime, here is your one shilling eight pence. Rest now, brave toiler, after your lifelong struggle for food. Meantime, the cannons were trained, the reserves called out, and the workers themselves disorganized by the many methods well known to the middle classes, till one fine day they were told to go and colonize Africa or be shot down. Very different will be the result if the workers claim the right to well-being. In claiming that right, they claim the right to possess the wealth of the community, to take the houses to dwell in, to take 
the houses to dwell in, according to the needs of each family, to seize the stores of food and learn the meaning of plenty after having known famine too well. They proclaim their right to all wealth, fruit of the labor of past and present generations, and learn by its means to enjoy those higher pleasures of art and science too long monopolized by the middle classes. And while asserting their right to live in comfort, they assert what is still more important, their right to decide for themselves what this comfort shall be what must be produced to ensure it, what discarded as no longer of value. The right to well-being means the possibility of living like human beings and of bringing up children to be members of a society and of bringing up children to be members of a society better than ours. Whilst the right to work only means the right to be always a wage slave, a drudge, ruled over and exploited by the middle class of the future. The right to well-being is the social revolution. The right to work means nothing but the treadmill of commercialism. It is high time for the worker to assert his right to the common inheritance and to enter into possession. And so ends chapter two of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. I like here that Kropotkin discusses what other revolutionaries up to this point have really not considered, um, which is to say his idea that, look, nobody's going to be <laughs> defending the ideals of a revolution when they can't feed themselves, right? There is a strenuousness to privation, and in fact, I think uh, something, uh, there's a lot of things he misses here, obviously. I mean, he he's <clears throat> certainly limited in his scope of what industry will become. You know, that's inevitable. I, I think that the, the loose ideas still apply. Um, but an issue is the fact that uh, institutions of capital have if anything, strengthened their devices of oppression, strengthened their weapons in a literal sense and in other senses. By forcing most of a nation to live paycheck to paycheck, it's hard to get people the energy they need to stand up to capital. And Kropotkin's idea of violent revolution is also an interesting one in that he rejects that as the idea of what revolution is. Now, to be fair, he's like, yeah, it rules, <laughs> and who can blame him? But the revolution Kropotkin proposes is not that, as he expressly says, the revolution he proposes is putting food in the bellies of people who are hungry, of housing people who do not have homes, of, communi of communalizing property in all spheres for all. That is the revolution. He's not wrong, I think, in his assessment that you can't expect a sitting government or really any form of government to become revolutionary, right? To move toward this idea of revolution because government inherently forms a hierarchy. These institutions are deciding what is best, what people need. And in fact, this is why personally I view anarchism not necessarily as a holistic philosophy, but more as a tool 
uh, sort of like deconstruction, if you're familiar with that. And if you're not, just ignore that last sentence. But a tool for pointing our senses at institutions, exposing their injustices and the injustices of their hierarchies as an ongoing tool, method, uh, epistemology. Like that's um, my personal take on, on anarchist thinking is that it works for me best when I think of it as a way of critiquing inequity and injustice in the various systems in which we have centralized our power. The other problem, and this is one I also have trouble reconciling, is that institutions can be, and this is going to be absolute heresy, useful in many ways. It can be useful to have them. Uh, uh, so how do we keep checks on those institutions, right, if we're trying to keep them equitable? That's where direct democracy comes in. Anarchism cannot exist without direct democracy, without the input of all together. That is well-being for all. Well-being for all cannot be determined by the few. It cannot be determined by the levers of power. It cannot be determined by institutions, by the old guard, by a new guard. It must be determined by all. The only people who know what is best for everyone is everyone. And, you know, now that I've already committed heresy by saying institutions are sometimes quite necessary and useful, I'll add, that's my caveat, is that the institutions do not dictate what constitutes well-being. What constitutes well-being should dictate the institutions. The prime focus is what I'm getting from Kropotkin's writing, the, the main message that I think is important here is that the prime focus is on the needs of people. In addition, I like what we see here, uh, something that is very common to anarchistic writings, which is that focus on praxis and practicality and material conditions. Kropotkin recognizes this idea that action, direct, beneficial action for everyone is not just the end goal of the revolution, but the revolution itself. Another thing I'll leave you with, uh, my anarchist friends, is I think it's easy to feel squeamish when the idea of a violent revolution comes up. Um, certainly that's not a foreign idea to me. You know, I, I myself am like, nah, I don't know about that. Uh, uh, so I'll tilt my own hand there. But I will also add that in many, many ways, the state itself is violence. Capitalism is violence. Should that violence be met violently? I can't say. I think it doesn't have to be, but there are many, many theorists and thinkers who would disagree with me and support their points quite well. It is difficult to imagine overturning social institutions that are so ingrained simply by talking which again is why anarchism is so focused and fixated on those practicalities. Well, enough about that. You all get out there and seize the means of production, my little anarchist friends. <laughs>